every once in a while in archaeology, I run across a story that's just incredibly amazing. So I wanted to share this one with you. I heard this one from uh, Eugene Mayhew, the professor at Michigan Theological Seminary. And uh, so I wanted to tell you the story because I want you to kind of put your shoes, put your feet in the shoes of an archaeologist um, who is about on the cusp of an incredible discovery. So I want to tell you about the amulets at Ketef Hinnom. Um, it is the greatest find that they discovered, these amulets, these necklaces with a, with a little engraving on the inside. And uh, it is the greatest find since the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, what it was was um, a burial place of a family, and uh, one of the bodies had, or maybe two of the bodies had, uh, a little necklace uh, with a rolled up little piece of silver on the inside that when archaeologists found the amulet, opened it up and unrolled it, what you had is the earliest known citation of Deuteronomy 7, 9, number 6. You know, the high priestly blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you. So there's a couple of passages there that were carved in the earliest evidence of Hebrew writing uh, it predates the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it This little amulet is the earliest example of a confessional statement concerning Yahweh, which means that the verse of the high priestly blessing was not just quoted, but it was used as a blessing, a confessional statement about, uh, about God. So this one find was in a, in a burial place just right on the edge of Jerusalem. It was the earliest known citation of text from the Hebrew Bible, earliest confessional statement, oldest extra-biblical reference to Yahweh, which means we have Scripture, but outside of Scripture, the oldest reference to the Hebrew God was on this amulet. And it's the earliest example of Hebrew writing. It doesn't look like the block style of, of writing that comes later. It's uh, the earliest Paleo Hebrew writing um, that we found. So imagine if you're an archaeologist and you're able to suddenly locate this. So what's cool about it is the story of how this amulet was found and, uh, and then looking at the significance, the best find since the Dead Sea Scrolls. So here's the story. Um, the find was instigated by Gabriel Barquet. Um, these two amulets date from the time of Jeremiah. They date from the 7th century BC, so about 2,700 years ago. And here's what he wrote. He has his own account, and so this is how the find came about. Uh, with a little donation in 1975, I did a modest exploration and found remnants from an ancient Christian church and a burial grave. It was enough to prove that it was a worthwhile location. In 1979 to 1980, I came back with a limited budget under the sponsorship of Tel Aviv University. So the kids that were working with him were like 12 and 13 year old volunteers from an archaeology club, right? And so you got 12 and 13 year olds working with the archaeologist on a site that was, uh, he thought, interesting, but he had no idea what was there. Um, and what he found was this this grave site. We excavated um, the present day church. The graves were in bad shape. They had collapsed roofs and the caves had all been looted. Well, that's disappointing for an archeologist. And on top of the caves, there's a road. <laughs> so what do you do with that, right? But here's what he said. A one cave had a series of headrests and burial benches. So it's, it's a family grave site that has been carved into the rock there are uh, bed um, benches for the bodies, a one bench shaped with a cushion, and then six headrests. Um, and but they found uh, a bead, and then under the bench they found the bone box of where the bones were. So you you bury the body, it decays, and then the bones are scraped into the bone box and saved. So they found this cave that has these elements of several family members could have been buried there. Um, but um, he was disappointed, he says. And so 
what he did was these kids who were there helping him, uh, one kid was kind of particularly bugging him. And so what do you do with this annoying kid? You put him in a place where he would be out of the sight of the archaeologist, give him a job to do, like cleaning up the area. So <laughs> Dr. Barquet tells this boy right there, I told Nathan the repository had to be as clean as his mother's kitchen. Uh, it had to be clean for the photography. So this is what Dr. Barquet wrote. Not too long afterwards, I felt him tugging at my shirt again. Nathan had in his hands almost complete pottery vessels. This time I pulled at his shirt, took him back to the area, and asked where he found them. Bored, Nathan had banged on the floor with a hammer, and under the rocks he found the pottery. Later that day, the young archaeologists, the volunteers, all went home, and little Nathan went home with his peers. Then, he says, I recruited archaeology students from Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and the Institute for Holy Land Studies, and uh, they grabbed electricity from the area church, brought it over, worked 24 hours around the clock, and this is that unrolled piece of silver that I talked to you about. All right, so... They find the bodies. It's a part of the tomb that has not been looted. And the one of the bodies has this amulet. There's actually two amulets. Um, and unrolled, it looks like that. All right, so now we got to look at the text a little bit and see how linguists have rebuilt what they're able to read and then what has been decayed. So what we have on the left is the text that is there. And you, those are the pieces that you can see. So... The first line has God's name, but you can see it's incomplete. Second line, we haven't figured out what it says. Third line has some letters. Do you see how that fits? So the brackets tell you what has been supplied by the translator. Dots mean we don't know. And uh, what is in uh, regular print is what has been rebuilt, uh, confidently translated by the linguists. So here's the amulet, and there's what the amulet says. Yahweh, and then we don't know what line two is. The great who keeps, there's something missing there, who keeps the covenant and graciousness toward those who love him, those who keep his commandments. The eternal, verse nine, the blessing more than any snare and more than evil for redemption is in him. See, it's a conflation of a couple of different passages, um, but at the bottom part is what we're interested in, that high priestly blessing. It says, 12, for Yahweh is our restorer and our rock, and here's the blessing, may Yahweh bless you and may he keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine. Do you see? Now imagine, they have this find, that was actually discovered by a bored 12-year-old kid with a hammer, and it becomes the oldest example of Hebrew writing, predating anything that we had already. Oh, and the thing is, they can't find the kid. So they never did locate Nathan again. So there's a, a little Nathan, who's now an adult older man, <laughs> but not knowing that he made the most incredible find in uh, Jewish language, in the Hebrew language, the oldest find yet. <laughs> so he's out there. If you know him, uh, tell him that's a pretty incredible thing you did. All right, so here's what was in that cave. Uh, pottery, uh, iron and bronze works. Remember, this one didn't get looted like the other ones. Uh, needles, pins, glass bottles, and jewelry. Uh, there were five chambers in a central hall that sort of connected this burial area. And research has been done since then, and the find was determined to be immediately before the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Do you know what that means? It means that when a family lost a family member and buried them, it was exactly the same time that Jeremiah was walking around the city uh, delivering his message of judgment. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> so sometimes in archaeology, uh, something as simple as a bored young man 
can result in an incredible discovery. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you the story of the amulets at Ketef Hinnom because maybe you too could be an archaeologist. <laughs>